Our next set of notes is about the rise of democracy, sometimes called Jacksonian democracy, from 1824 to 1828. So I start the PowerPoint by looking at this picture of Mer Americans sitting around doing what is America's favorite pastime in the 1820s, talking about politics. So let's start with Jacksonian democracy. What is it? Well, before we talk about what it is, let's go back and talk about Jeffersonian democracy. Jeffersonian democracy was the idea that men should be more involved in the government. Not just any men, but the common men. And so if we look at Jefferson, he says that we should lower property requirements so that most white men can vote. If you remember before Jefferson, America was controlled by elite citizens who you had to have a certain amount of property, a fairly large amount of property, to vote because the idea was that only educated, tax-paying people should be able to have some say in the government. And Jefferson, with his Revolution of 1800, says that more and more common white men should be able to vote because that's democracy. But by the time we get to the 1820s, we're going to see that President Jackson and other people in his party believe that not just we shouldn't have really any property requirements at all. We should allow all white men to have the power to vote. Because Jacksonian democracy is about increasing democracy, at least as far as white men go, to encompass everyone. Next, Jeffersonian democracy believed that rich, educated, elite men should be elected to office. And so ja Jefferson believed that all, almost all or, uh, white men should vote. But once they vote, they should all vote for their betters. They should vote for people who went to Harvard, to William and Mary, people who have an education, people who are thoughtful, and we should let white men vote, but have them choose the best among themselves to lead the government. But democracy in Jackson's time says that not only should all white men vote, no property requirements, but they should also be allowed to hold and serve in public office. If we trust the common man to vote, we should trust him to run the government. And so we see democracy under Jacksonian democracy is expanding, getting bigger, encompassing more people. So again, Jefferson trusts the elite to run the government, and Jackson says that all elected officials um, should be from the common man, but we also have this idea of rotation in office. Uh, the rotation in office idea is that in order to expand democracy, we should let more people actually serve in office. And so while Jefferson said you should vote for the elite men in your community because they can be trusted and they can serve again and again and again because they've got experience and they've got education, Jacksonian democracy said that some the people should elect somebody from among themselves, a, a common man. He should go to Washington, D.C., serve for two, four, or six years, whatever part of the government he's in, and then he should go back to the people and make room for a new politician to come in. This will allow more people to be in, involved in the political process. More people will be able to serve in public office. So it's more democratic. But in addition to that, what we're going to see is that under Jefferson's model, you could have somebody elected to Congress, and they could serve there for 10, 20, 30 years, and as the longer they serve in Congress in Washington, D.C., the more literally and figuratively they're away from the lives of the common man. They start to lose touch with the common man. But under Jackson's rotation in office idea is that every two, four, or six years, depending on your term, you're going to be elected, you're going to serve, and then you're going to go back to the common man. So we always have somebody who's fresh from the common man who's in Washington, D.C., um, fresh from their lives. And so he knows the pain and the suffering and the concerns of the common man because he was just there. And he's never going to build up any kind of isolation from the common man because as soon as he's in office, He'll only serve one term, and then he'll go back. And we have a continual supply of people who are in touch with the ideas and needs of the common man. Much more democratic. Now, Jefferson was very pro-farmer. If you remember, he believed that only farmers could have democracy. On election day, when you go to vote, farmers are independent businessmen. They control their own lives, and so nobody can control their vote. That's democracy. Um, what does Jackson believe? Well, he's also pro-farmer. And so that part of the idea of uh, democracy does not change between these two men. They both believe that the farmer, the common man, which is most of Americans at this time, um, they're the ones that should be trusted with the vote. Jefferson believed in states' rights. In other words, in this tug-of-war between the federal government and the state governments, who should have more power? 
Well, Jefferson certainly said he believed in the states having more rights because the states are physically closer to the people. If you're a common man and you want to go talk to your governor or you want to go talk to your local elected official, you can. He's not that far away. But if we have more power to the federal government, well, then you're going to have to go a long ways away to Washington, D.C., and they may or may not listen to you. You may not be able to get get there. And so local government is more democratic because it's figuratively and literally closer to the people. So what does Jackson believe? Well, he believes in the same thing. So again, we see another continuity. They both believe that most of the power should be concentrated in the hands of local and state government, not some far-off federal power. If you remember, Jefferson's party was called the Democratic-Republican Party. But by the time we get to Jackson, it's just going to be called the Democratic Party. We're going to lose the Republican part of the name because they really want to emphasize that this is a party of the common man. It's a party of democracy, of the people. And so from this point on, we're going to call the party of Jefferson and Jackson, moving forward, just the Democratic Party. So what is the reason for this increased emphasis on democracy? Yes, we've talked about democracy under Jefferson, but as we slide over to the 1820s and 30s when we talk about the age of Jackson, why is there this increased emphasis on expanding democracy to more and more people and more and more of the common man? Well, in part, it's because of the same reason we have Jeffersonian democracy. This idea of the spirit of 76, it doesn't go away. Americans have consistently and continuously believed in the ideas of the Enlightenment, and they just never go away. That America is for the common man. We should have freedom, democracy, liberty. And so we keep believing that. And so that continuous idea is going to always push us to include more people in the government. Next, land requirements become irrelevant. As the United States adds more and more land out west, Louisiana Purchase, etc., there's so much land out there that it's cheap. And so to say to somebody that in order to vote you have to have a certain amount of land, well, that's very easy for a lot of people to get land because it's so cheap and it's so abundant. And so the property requirement, really, almost all white men can reach. And so it's very easy to just get rid of property requirements because it's really most white men anyway. So more men are going to vote. Next, we have the Panic of 1819. So we won't go into it in a great detail, but the Panic of 1819 was caused when people were over-speculating in land out west. They thought that it was worth more than it actually was. There was this rush to buy land out west. And people would buy land cheap and then turn around and sell it for a higher price and then turn around and sell it for a higher price and et cetera, et cetera. Until one day in 1819, we realize that the land is way overvalued, that we've paid too much for it. And so now there's a rush to sell the land. But if everybody's selling and nobody's buying, it's a panic and land prices drop precipitously. So we see, well, what does this have to do with the growth of democracy? Why is this going to make the common man want to vote more? Because the common man will blame Eastern elite bankers for this problem. Now, we can't put the whole blame at Eastern elite bankers, but if you're a common man and you bought a farm for way over market value, um, when the, the bubble was going on, when everybody thought land was the way to, place to put your money, and then all of a sudden that bubble bursts and land is not worth as much as it used to, well, your land is overvalued and you can't sell it. And it's a tough time paying back the bank that you borrowed all the money from to buy that land. And so the bank, they come, they knock on your door, and they say you need to pay your mortgage and you can't. And so the bank takes your land away. And so if we're going to blame anybody for this, we're going to blame the person who's taking our land away. We're not blaming ourselves for buying the land at too high of a price. People rarely blame themselves for anything. And so we're going to blame the person who's coming and knocking on our door and saying, give us your farm or pay your loan back. And so we're going to see there's created a lot of animosity towards rich elite um, Easterners and bank owners because of the Panic of 1819. And so that's growth of democracy. The common one man wants to make sure that the common man are in power. The common man control the government. The common man control banks so this doesn't happen again. So this is a reason for the increase in democracy. Next, we see that there's lots of political issues going on. So here's just one of them. Um, the Missouri Compromise. If you remember, we talked about the Missouri Compromise going on, and it's this idea, is should the land out west be free or slave? Well, this was such a big, huge question of the time that it, people got energized about it, they got excited about it, and they started to pay attention to politics. And so anytime you have more people paying attention to politics, they say, hey, I want a part of that process. I want to be able to vote. I want the government to listen to me. And so that also increases voter turnout, and that increases the amount of people voting and wanting the right to vote. 
So we talked about the causes of Jacksonian democracy. Let's talk about some of its impact on America and political parties. First of all, we're going to see when we lower property requirements and more people are actually excited to vote and hold office, we're going to see voter turnout increase. And so here we have this famous picture of Election Day in Philadelphia, and it's like a holiday atmosphere, Election Day. You see a float in the back center of the picture. Everybody's out. They're waving flags. They're talking about politics. And so we see that during the 1820s and 30s, we're going to see large number of Americans turn out, argue, discuss, debate, get excited about politics, uh, politics, and they're going to vote. Because political parties, they're going to have to, they're going to have to change as a result of this increased democracy. In the past. Political parties were led by elite men, even if they were Democratic Republicans. They were led like men by Madison and Jefferson and, and Burr. Uh, and if you were a Federalist, you were led by men like Hamilton and Adams. So both political parties, even though they disagree about um, several things, they both are still led by these common elite, I'm sorry, they're led by these elite men. Um, and so, and, and they thought everybody would just vote for them. But now that politics is changing, that more men are voting, and they want common men in Congress, in the White House, in whatever. And so we're going to see that, that with more voter turnout, parties are going to have to actually change. They can't just count on the common men to give them their vote because we're elite and we're better than you. Now we have to actually go convince the common man that they should vote for us. As more and more of the, you know, the lower class and middle class men start to vote, um, they become important and we have to pay attention to them. And so we have to go get their vote. And so we see that political parties gain a structure. It used to be the political parties were just, again, groups of men that had similar interests and they were led by a few elite. Um, and that was it. But now we're going to see, in order to go get those votes, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to have some hierarchy on our parties. We're going to have to have somebody who's in charge of getting all the votes out for a state. And then we're going to divide that further because the state's a pretty big area. And so we'll have to have, you know, we're going to have to have everybody in charge of each county and then everybody in charge of each uh, precinct or ward or part of a city and everybody in charge of each neighborhood. So we have to go get those common men votes, and so we have to have some organization to figure out how we're going to do it. We have to divide up the task because it's such a big task now because so many people are voting. So we're going to see parties gain structure. If you think about it today, both the Republicans and Democratic parties, they both have party chairmen. They have people that are in charge of each state. Like I said, people are in charge of each city, county, trying to go organize people to get them to vote for their party, to convince the common men to vote for them. So we're going to see campaigning. And again, let's do a change over time. Um, during the time of Jefferson and Washington and Adams, it was considered a faux pas. Um, elite men did not actually go out and ask for your vote. That was considered demeaning to them to, for an elite guy to ask a common man for his vote. Um, and so, And they really didn't need to because everybody knew that they would just vote for the best among them. But now with this emphasis on the common man voting and holding office... We have to actually go out and convince people that you should vote for me because I'm just like you. I can no longer say you should vote for me because I'm the best, I'm the most educated. That's going to rub voters the wrong way. They don't like elite. And so now I'm going to have to go get them to vote for me by convincing them. And so we have to start campaigning. We have to go convince them to vote for us. So we start to get campaign banners and buttons and bands and parades. And we have to go try to get people to vote for us to convince them to vote for us. So a way to get people to convince, to be convinced to vote for you is not just put up a banner and have a parade, but you also have to start writing a platform. So during the age of Jacksonian democracy, we start to see parties experiment with platforms. A platform is a, a written list of ideas that your party believes in. And so again, it's this idea of convincing the common man. Before, you said, well, you will vote for me because I'm an elite and I'm better than you. And everybody was like, okay. But now we have to convince the common man that I'm just like you, and I have, then you're just as good as I am, and so I'm going to have to engage an argument with you, and I'm going to have to list out all the, re the things I believe in. That's called my platform as a party. What are we for? Are we for tariffs? Are we against tariffs? Are we for the National Bank or not? And so common men get to make a choice. If I'm a common man, I hear from the party, and I say, okay, what's your platform? And if I agree with it, I'll vote for you. If I don't, 
I won't. I'll vote for the other party. And so writing down your platform is much more democratic because we have to be beholden to the common man. We have to convince them and put it in writing. Next, we see this idea of King Caucus dying. King Co a caucus is a meeting. And King Caucus was this idea in the age of Adams, Washington, Jefferson, that the elite men of either party, they would be the ones that would actually pick the candidate that would run for Congress or the Senate or the presidency. The, the common people didn't get to choose who their candidates were. It would be decided in some smoke-filled lock room where the elite men were drinking sherry or whatever, and they would say to the common people, here's our party's candidate, this is the person you should vote for. But now that seems very elitist, and that doesn't give the common man um, any choice in it. And so we're going to see that the people will start demanding um, that instead of the caucus, the small elite group of men choosing things, the people should start choosing their candidates. Um, and so again, this gives more power to the people instead of the elite. So let's talk about this common man election in action. We see the election of 1824. It is an important election. So we are just getting rid of the presidency of Monroe, the heir of good feelings, partially named because there was only one political party in America. The Federalist Party is dead, and all we have is the Democratic-Republican Party. And so all the major candidates in 1824 are going to be Democratic-Republicans. Here are three of them. Henry Clay from Kentucky, Andrew Jackson also from the West, and John Quincy Adams from Massachusetts. Um, John C. Calhoun is really running to be vice president. He actually tells a couple of these candidates, he, he, he gets along with a couple of them, he says, look, if, you're, either, if any of you guys are president, I'll be your vice president. He believes that this is the stepping stone to the future presidency. And so really, there are more candidates, but we're really just going to focus on Clay, Jackson, and Adams. And so all of these people are on the same party. It's still the era of good feeling. And so they're all running for the White House. So what are the returns? And if we can see it, this map, it's pretty confusing. There's no clear winner. Uh, John Quincy Adams is going to get about 32% uh, of the electoral vote. Jackson is going to get 38% of the electoral vote. Um, Crawford, who we're not going to talk about too much, he's going to get 16%. And then we have Clay getting uh, bringing up the rear at 14%. And so what you notice here is nobody wins the electoral vote. To win, you have to have 51%. Nobody gets that. Also, we see that nobody gets the majority of the popular vote, although it's clear that most of the people in America... Um, just below a majority want Jackson to be the president, 43%. And so Andrew Jackson wins the, he wins the popular vote, but not the electoral vote. Nobody wins the electoral vote. Like I said, you have to get 51%. And the way the Constitution is written, if nobody gets 51% of the electoral vote, then the House of Representatives decide from among the two top candidates. And so either Jackson or Clay will be the next president of the United States. Um, Clay is out. Um, and so we see, we don't have a constitutional crisis because we this is addressed in the Constitution. And so, okay, the House of Representatives is going to choose the next president of the United States. Now, Henry Clay, even though he's not in the running anymore, he's going to have a tremendous amount to say in the outcome of this election. Because lo and behold, Henry Clay is the Speaker of the House. He is the guy in charge of the House of Representatives who's picking the next president. And even though he only has one vote in the House of Representatives, he's the speaker, which means he has a lot of influence. And so Henry Clay, basically, whichever way he leans, whether he's going to vote for Jackson or Adams, that's pretty much who the uh, Congress is going to choose. And so both candidates are very interested in getting Clay's support. So what happens? What does Clay do? Um, now, Clay is not a big supporter of Andrew Jackson. They're rival politicians from the West, one's from Kentucky, one's from Tennessee, and Clay says famously, I cannot believe that killing 2,500 Englishmen at New Orleans qualifies for the various difficult and complicated duties of the chief magistrate. Basically, Clay does not think that Andrew Jackson, who's the hero of New Orleans, is qualified to be president. Um, and so what we see is that Henry Clay tells people to vote for John Quincy Adams. And so because of that, John Quincy Adams is the next president, even though Andrew Jackson got 38% of the popular vote as opposed to 32%, I'm sorry, 43% of the popular vote as opposed to 31% by Adams. Now, a few, a little bit after the election, what happens is John Quincy Adams, the president, 
fine. Um, the House of Representatives voted for him, largely due to Clay's influence. But then what becomes known to the public is, lo and behold, Henry Clay is nominated by uh, John Quincy Adams as his Secretary of State, which is a very high-ranking, prestigious position within the executive branch. In fact, um, either the Vice President or the Secretary of State typically becomes the next President, um, and so it seems like a corrupt bargain. People believe that Clay, that Adams got Clay to vote for him by promising him the State Department. Now, there is not very much evidence that says that this actually happened, but in people's minds, they perceive it as happening. Adams becomes president because of Clay's endorsement, and then wouldn't you know it, Clay becomes the next Secretary of State. And so this is called the corrupt bargain, and for the most part, it's a major reason why John Quincy Adams has only one term. His presidency right off the bat is rocked by scandal. So let's talk about this one-term guy. We have the presidency of John Quincy Adams. Now, he's elected in 1824-ish, as we just talked about, um, and so he's going to serve one term. He's going to take over in 1825 and go until 1829. So we have this idea that he's the right man for the presidency, but just at the wrong time. And so John Quincy Adams, we see here pictured, fun-loving looking guy, um, he would probably be a Federalist if the Federalist Party still existed. But there's only one political party, and that's the Democratic Republican, so he kind of has to join that. The reason I say he's a Federalist is because just like his dad, we're going to find out that John Quincy Adams believes in a national bank, he's very pro-business, he's also pro-elite. Um, and so he is just kind of the, at the wrong time in history. He would have been a great Federalist president, um, but he has these very elitist ideas about who should run America and who America should be for. And in this time of increased democracy, Jacksonian democracy, this doesn't fit with what America is ready for. So that's what I mean by wrong time. So let's talk about why he's the right man. John Quincy Adams has been in the service of the United States government his whole adult life. He has served as the ambassador to most of the countries in Europe, um, he helped sign the Treaty of Ghent, ending the War of 1812. Of course, he signed the adams onis Treaty. He wrote the Monroe Doctrine. He's a very thoughtful, educated, experienced man. And really, there's nobody better qualified to be president. So he is certainly the right man for the job. However, not at a time where we were emphasizing the common man, because he's an elitist. So... Let's talk about the divisive issues that is happening from 1825 to really about 1840, um, the age of Jackson. And you'll notice some of these issues we've seen before. Uh, we could talk about a synthesis being these issues back when Hamilton was trying for his financial plan. And so these issues are not going away. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide up America into the three regions. The north, which is basically north of the Mason-Dixon line from Pennsylvania north. The South, which is along the East Coast from Mason-Dixon Line or Maryland South, the Old South, the Colonial South. And then we see the West, uh, states west of the Appalachian Mountains, some of these new states that we added after the War of 1812 or just before. And so these three parts of the country, we're going to notice as we fill out this chart that they feel differently about each of these issues. This leads to sectionalism. The idea of sectionalism is, you know, in the era of good feelings, we had this idea of nationalism, that we just defeated Britain, we're very proud of who we are, and we're coming together as a country. But that doesn't last very long. Some of these issues will divide us, and they'll divide us by section. And so even though there's only one political party, it's not parties that are tearing us apart during the presidency of John Quincy Adams. It is the idea of sectionalism of these issues. One section of the country wants something than a different section of the country. So let's talk about each, how each section of the country feels about the tariff. Well, the North likes the tariff. The economy of the North, because of the market revolution, which we'll talk about later, is becoming more industrial, more centered on business and production. And since that's the case, they want the United States government to, pra to pass a strong tariff to protect American businesses, force Americans to buy American-made goods by putting a tax or a tariff on imports. This is very exciting for the North because this is going to help their economy grow. The South, of course, is not going to like the tariff. The South are primarily... Um, consumers. Now they do of course make tobacco and cotton, so we'll come back to that in a second, but they're not producing anything. They're not producing clothes, they're not producing pianos, they're not producing shoes, and so they have to buy all of those things. Now in the past they were able to buy them cheap from Europe, 
but now since the tariff is happening, um, prices are going to go up and they're going to be forced to buy American-made goods, which of course the tariff allows those prices to go up too. Um, and so we see the consumers in the South are going to be paying a lot more. So are the consumers who are primarily farmers in the West. And so we're going to see Southern and Westerners going to have to pay more for their goods, but not have any benefit from it. One more thing about the South is they also don't like the tariff because not only does it hurt them as consumers, it hurts them as producers. The South's major customer for their cotton and tobacco is Europe. And if we put a tariff on European goods, of course, they're going to put a tariff back on ours. And so the South has a tough time selling their goods to other countries. So you see, it's kind of a double whammy here for the South. They get hurt as consumers, paying more for their goods, and they also get hurt as producers. And so we see that the tariff is liked by the North, but not by the South and the West. Next, federal power. Who should have more power in the, in the government, the federal government or the states? Um, now, if you're going to be very pro-business, you want the government to be strong, to pass tariffs, to create banks, to do all the things it needs to do to create the economy, make the economy better. And so typically the North is going to be pro-strong government, pro-federal government. However, the South and the West are not. The South and the West are composed mostly of farmers, common men, and they distrust strong central government. They think it's controlled by the elite, those Easterners, and they want the common man to be able to control their government, which means it should be local. If they believe in what we call as states' rights. All the power should be reserved for the states. Strict construction we have talked about before. Next, the National Bank. Now, if you remember, and Alexander Hamilton, one of his main uh, centerpieces of his financial program was to have a national bank. It would stimulate the economy by giving businesses loans um, and help America become more industrial. Well, in 1816, that first bank of the United States was due to be done. Uh, it was supposed to last 20 years, and then we had to decide if we wanted the bank again. And so in 1816, as part of the American system, they did re-up the bank, and it's called the Second Bank of the United States, sometimes called the BUS, Bank of the United States. And the North really likes this because, again, the North is very business-centered. They, they need a large, huge bank funded by the United States government so they can take out loans and start bigger businesses and become more industrial. But the South is farmers. The West is farmers. The bank really doesn't help them. Um, these, most of the loans from the National Bank go to major industries, big players already, rich people who, who want to get richer. And so most of these common men farmers don't get helped out by the bank. Um, they think it controls the economy. It doesn't help them, so they're going to be anti-bank. Next, internal improvements. Internal improvements, if you remember, they're part of the American system. We should build up our economy by building roads, bridges, canals, later on railroads. Um, and so we see that this is going to be um, liked by, let's start with the West here. The West is going to like internal improvements because if I'm a farmer out in Illinois, I want to be able to get my crops to market. And the best way to do that is build a road. Maybe it's the national road you see in the picture on the left. Um, and so Westerners really like internal improvements. It helps them get their crops to market. They also like it as consumers. Um, we don't really make anything out West besides food. And so if I want to buy my wife a new dress or myself some new shoes or clothes or a new plow, I need to get those from those Eastern factories. And so I need, I need to get um, finished goods from out East. It makes my life, my quality of life better out West. And so the West certainly is excited about it. And then there's one final reason that the West really likes internal improvements. It makes it easier for more people to move out West. And the more people that move out West, the easier it is for these territories to become states and for these states then to get more and more power in Congress because they get more representatives. So let's now talk about the South. The South does not like internal improvements. This is where they disagree with their fellow farmers in the West. The South is already blessed with natural transportation. They have many large, slow-flowing, wide rivers in the south, and so it's very easy to get around places. You don't have to build roads and canals. They're already there, just naturally. And so the south doesn't want to be taxed, so that the west can have a better economy. Why should I pay for somebody else? If the west wants roads, let the west pay for roads. And so the south doesn't like high, like high taxes that will have to be used to pay for these internal improvements. And then the north here, I have kind of a meh symbol. Some people in the north like internal improvements and some people don't. So they're kind of mixed on it. The people that like internal improvements are, you guessed it, they're the factory owners. They want to get the raw materials from out west 
to their factories so they can turn it into something. And then once they've made a plow or a shirt or whatever it is in their factory, they want to be able to sell it to their markets, the farmers out west. And so for businessmen, they certainly want internal improvements. But if you're concerned about politics and if you're concerned about power, you don't like internal improvements in the north. So that's this is the downside of internal improvements. Let's say I'm the state of Massachusetts. I'm in the northeast. And I've had a large say in what goes on in the government for a long time. I'm one of the original 13 states. I've had, my, I've had a lot of influence over the government. But as we build internal improvements, I said it makes it easier for people to move out west. And so we start adding western states. And they start to get more power in Congress as their population goes up, which means that the relative power of the northeast shrinks in Congress. As we add more states... The Northeast has less and less say in what goes on in national issues. And so this is why they're not all that excited about internal improvements. Next divisive issue, slavery. Um, and so the South, of course, let's start with them. They're very excited about slavery. They wanted to continue. Don't mess with slavery. They wanted to expand because that's what their economy is based on. Growing cash crops profitably by using cheap slave labor. So let's talk about the West. The West is kind of meh. Again, some Westerners like it, some Westerners don't. It really depends on which part of the West you're in. If you're in what we used to call the Northwest, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, you don't want slavery to expand out West. Um, you don't like it, not because you're an abolitionist and you think slavery is morally wrong, but you don't like it because the more we allow slavery to expand west, then those rich plantation owners will race out west, and since they have money, they'll buy up all the new land and the best land out west. Which means if I'm just a regular common man um, farmer, I'm not going to be able to get that good land because it's already going to be all purchased by the rich plantation owners. And so we see northwestern farmers are against the expansion of slavery. However, if I'm a farmer in the southwest, Mississippi, Alabama those kinds of places. I want slavery to expand. I want it to keep going because, of course, I have slaves and I grow cash crops and I want to be able to buy more cash crops and more land and use slaves to do it. And so we see that the West is kind of split on this depending on which part of the West you're in. Now, in the North, we see that they don't, they're kind of meh again about slavery. Um, we're talking North, we're talking like New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Massachusetts. Most people in the North they don't care about slavery one way or the other. They typically don't see many African Americans in the North because there aren't that you know, there's not cash crops, so we don't need slaves. Um, you know, they're not all that excited about it one way or the other. Um, they really wish the issue would go away and they could ignore it. Um, we do see some abolitionists start to grow in this time period, but they're always a very small group um, in the North, um, and so most Northerners just don't care about it one way or the other. Just you don't make me think about it. So as, you know, we talked about John Quincy Adams, he's going to be elected as a, a Democratic Republican, but we said he's not really. He's really a Federalist at heart. And as John Quincy Adams starts to go with his presidency, it's very apparent that he's in favor of a lot of these things that support the North. He's in favor of the tariff. He's in favor of strong federal power. He's in favor of the National Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we, we see that he also is in favor of elite rule of America. So if he could be a Federalist, he would be. But the Federalist doesn't exist anymore. And so a lot of people are very critical of John Quincy Adams. They're like, you said you're a Democratic Republican, but you're really a Federalist at heart. We don't want you in our party. And so we see that the Democratic Republican Party splits under the presidency of Adams. Um, and so the era of good feelings comes to an end. We're going to see the return of two-party rule. One party just can't make all of these different sections and different kinds of people happy. And so... John Quincy Adams is going to help create a new party called the National Republicans. So if we think in terms of synthesis, it's really just a reincarnation of the Federalist Party in many, many ways. They believe in strong government and pro-business. And then the people who are for the common man and states' rights, they're just going to call themselves Democrats. Like I said before, they're going to drop the Republican and really focus on that they are Democrats, party of the common man. And then they're, of course, going to be the strongest in the South and the West. So John Quincy Adams, let's talk about him as his effectiveness as president. He says that he is in favor of a strong national government. But when push comes to shove, we're going to find out he's really not all that effective as a leader of a strong federal government. So our story begins in Georgia. Now the state of Georgia had a lot of Cherokee Indians living in the state. 
Um, and for the most part, we're going to find out that they lived in relative peace with their neighbors. The Cherokee Indians were one of the quote-unquote civilized tribes, and they had adopted a lot of white culture, an alphabet, a constitution, even owning slaves and growing cash crops. And so they were trying to assimilate in to some extent to the white society around them. And so things were okay until, of course, we find gold located in northwest Georgia on Cherokee Indian land. And so white people start pouring into the Cherokee land, um, and the Cherokee, of course, say, you can't do this. Friction results, a little bit of fighting. And so um, the state of Georgia goes to the Cherokee Indians and say, look, we've got problems here. We want you to give up a whole bunch of land to the white people. And the Cherokee Indians say, no, this is our land. You can't do that. And so basically the state of Georgia says, well, we don't care. Um, and they more or less hold a gun to the Cherokee Indians' head and say, sign this treaty. It's called the Treaty of Indian Springs. And as a result of it, the Cherokee Indians and the Creek Indians will lose about 4.7 million acres of their land, a huge chunk of their land. They signed the treaty, but they signed it under duress. They were, signed, they were forced to do it. And so they appeal to John Quincy Adams. They say, look, we're Americans. Um, we may not be U.S. citizens, um, but we were here before the rest of you, and we have rights, and you can't do this to us. And we've tried to live in peace with white America. And so John Quincy Adams takes their side, right? He says to the state of Georgia, look, this is a wrong treaty. You made him sign it unfairly. You were threatening him when you made him sign it. And so you need to tear up this treaty and start again. Um, and of course, the state of Georgia says, no, we're not going to do it. They basically say no to the president. And they say, if you don't like it, you come down here and make us. Um, and so John Quincy Adams backs off. Now, here we see his weakness. If he really believes in a strong federal government that has power over the states, maybe he should have sent an army down there. He should have um, been more forceful in his decision, but he doesn't because he doesn't want to risk a civil war. Um, and so he, we see he backs off. And of course, the big loser here is federal power, but it's also the Native Americans who are losing their land. So now we get to the tariff. And of course, I talked about how the North likes the tariff, the South and the West don't. Um, and so we get to what will be one of the biggest tariff battles in American history. Now, our story starts with the Vice President of the United States, the Vice President of John, C John, John Quincy Adams. His name is John C. Calhoun, and he wants more than anything in his life to be President someday. Um, and so as the next election is coming up, the election of 1828, he knows that John Quincy Adams is technically his boss, is not going to get reelected because he's so unpopular among the South and the West and the corrupt bargain, etc., um, that he's, he's scheming and trying to think, okay, how can I get myself elected, but also how can I get my fellow Democrats, remember they're just Democrats now, not Democratic Republicans, elected. And so he comes up with a scheme to use a, the tariff to get himself elected. So secretly, he writes a really high tariff. Um, it's going to be called the Tariff of 1828, um, and it's ludicrously high. Um, it is a very large tariff um, that if, it, if passed, it would completely raise the rates on imports coming into the United States. Now, it's kind of confusing. Why would he do this? John, John C. Calhoun is anti-tariff. So why would he write a huge high tariff? Well, first of all, he doesn't think it's ever going to pass because it's so crazy high. But second of all, he believes that um, his political party could use this um, as uh, an issue to get elected in the 1828 election. It's like a tool for his party to get elected. And so if you're a Democrat um, in the North, you can say, I'm for the tariff and that will make you happy. Northerners will like you and they'll vote for you. And if you're a Democrat in the South or the West, you can say, oh, this is a horrible tariff. I don't like it. Um, and so people would vote for you. And so you can use it to get elected. And John C. Calhoun is not afraid of this tariff passing. He just thinks it's a tool we can use that's never going to pass. Democrats on both sides, the North and the South, can use it to get elected, to say what you need to say to get elected. But it's never going to pass because it's so insanely high. In addition to that, one other thing, that if we propose this incredibly high tariff and it goes down to defeat, as it surely will, that that will set the precedent that tariffs are no longer favored in America. If this tariff fails, it will make it easier to kill the next tariff. And so, you know, this will make it better for the Democratic Republicans in the South, I'm sorry, the Democrats in the South and the West, because we're setting the precedent that we'll get rid of future tariffs. 
So now let's continue on with the tariff. Now the National Republicans, they 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 do have some reservations about this tariff. It is really high. Um, and they didn't think they'd ever be able to get a tariff passed this much on their own because holy cow, that's a high tariff. But they're not stupid. They see through John T. Calhoun's ploy. And they go ahead and pass the tariff anyway because at this point in time, they have a lot of influence in Congress. Um, and so they pass the tariff. And so the unthinkable happens. John C. Calhoun is shocked. His tariff passes. Now, this is going to hurt the economy of the South. I've already talked about why it hurts the economy of the South, but it really hurts the economy of the South because it's such a high tariff, something we weren't even thinking about. And so it was parts of the South go into economic freefall, especially South Carolina. South Carolina is a state that's heavily dependent on exports. They export cotton and tobacco to Europe. And when we pass this tariff, of course, Europe is going to pass their own tariff. And so the, the people in South Carolina are not going to have many people to sell their crops to. In addition to that, the people of South Carolina have to buy all their manufactured goods. Um, and if they buy them from Europe, those prices are going to go up because it's such a huge tariff. And so the South Carolinans think this is not right. Um, and so they lead a fight against the tariff, and they call it, a little bit of propaganda here, they call it the Tariff of Abominations. They can't just call it the Tariff of 28. Um, that's not mean enough. And so they're going to start to call the tariff and other tariffs that will come with this, like we see the Tariff of 32, as the Tariff of Abominations. It's hated. So South Carolina issues, the state of South Carolina issues the South Carolina Exposition. It's an official statement by the state, and it says that we think in South Carolina the tariff is unconstitutional. They go back to being strict constructionists, and they say that the federal government cannot purposely hurt the economy of one section of the country to benefit the economy of another section of the country. So they say it's unconstitutional, and they threaten... They threaten, they don't say they're actually going to do it yet, but they threaten if we don't get rid of this tariff as a country, we're going to nullify it in South Carolina, which means that in South Carolina, we're not going to let you enforce this tariff. We don't care what the federal government says, we're not going to do it. Now, they haven't actually said they're going to nullify it, but they threaten to nullify it. Now, this is a big, this, this means that it's now more than just about tariffs. So this fight now becomes about the concept of states' rights versus federal power. If a state can nullify, then what does that mean for the power of the federal government? It means the federal government has no power. If the federal government passes laws and each state can just say yes or no and nullify laws on their own, then there really isn't a reason for a federal government at all. The states can just do whatever they want. And this puts all the power in the hands of the state governments and almost none of it in the hands of the federal government. All right. Now, so John C. Calhoun, who's vice president of the United States at this point, people start complaining about how the South Carolina Exposition is going to lead to the downfall of America. It's tearing us apart. If states are allowed to nullify, then the federal government has no power, and we're just going to drift apart. But John C. Calhoun says, no, 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 this is just the opposite. John C. Calhoun did love America at this point, as we're going to find out later he doesn't, but at this point he does, and he says it's the only way to save the Union. He says, our country is growing, and the North and the South and the West are becoming vastly different. They have different needs. And as our country grows and the sections get different needs, eventually we may have a civil war, or we're going to see the states drift apart unless we have nullification. Nullification is actually going to allow states to stay together. Nullification, from John C. Calhoun's viewpoint, is that, look, if the South is allowed to nullify laws, then they can say, no, thank you, not in South Carolina, but you can go ahead and have the tariff in other states. And so it allows us to say no to things we don't like without actually seceding and breaking away. And so we have two different ways of viewing this tariff. Some people believe the tariff has to be enforced, and nullification is not good because it'll pull America apart. And others believe that nullification is the way to keep us together. It allows us to disagree peacefully without actually seceding. So as I talked about, this is an example of sectionalism versus nationalism and states' rights versus federal power. We will come back, by the way, we will come back to the tariff um, when we get to the next president. And so as all of these things are going on, debates about the bank, debates about tariffs, debates about states' rights versus federal power, what a great time for a presidential election. Um, and so we have our next election to know, the election of 1828. 
And just like the election of 1800, here's a synthesis, it's a very dirty election. There's lots of mudslinging. It's very partisan. The two-party system is back with a vengeance, and the two candidates hate each other. I mean, think about their, their past. John Quincy Adams was elected president in 1824, even though Jackson got most of the, more of the popular vote and more of the electoral vote, and so Jackson feels cheated. And so when he runs again for the presidency in 1828, he has a lot of animosity towards John Quincy Adams, who he thought, because of the corrupt bargain, stole the presidency. And of course, John Quincy Adams thinks that Jackson is just some uneducated Western buffoon who is not even fit to run for president. And so we see lots of anger on both sides. And so what is Jackson's party, the Democrats, what's their criticism of Adams? Well, first of all, they say, well, he's just a career politician. We've heard this before in current times, haven't we? They say he's just a career politician. He's always lived off the federal government. He's never actually made his own money. He's always lived off the taxpayers. And so he's just really just a charity case, always living off the taxpayers. Next, they say that he hasn't even been an American for most of his life. He's been the U.S. ambassador for so many other countries living in Europe that he doesn't even know what it's really like to be an American. Now, this pimp idea here, this is a great example of spin in politics. It's, it's an example of <laughs> um, twisting the truth. Um, what happens is Jackson, his supporters, says that when John Quincy Adams was the U.S. ambassador to the court of Russia, the, the king of Russia, the czar of Russia, he was at a party with Adams, and he said to Adams, who's that young, beautiful girl over there? And Adams knew the girl, and he offered to introduce them. And after that point, the czar had an affair with this young girl, and so, of course, the Jacksonians say that this is an example of John Quincy Adams being a pimp, because he pimped this young girl out to the czar of Russia. Well, that's not true. He just introduced her. But again, in politics, perception is reality, and so we see that this is a very nasty campaign. Next, they say that John Quincy Adams is a gambler, and so he can't be trusted with America because he has a pool table in the White House and a chess set, and those are games of skill and chance, um, and so that's just really like gambling, um, so he can't be trusted. Now, this is, look at today we look at them and think, well, that's just silly. But, of course, this is a much contested campaign. And as we can see in current elections, um, you know, anything can be taken and used by the other side to make the candidate look um, evil or bad or distrust or not trustworthy. And then, of course, they bring up the corrupt bargain. And even though there's not a lot of proof that, you know, Quincy Adams got the presidency by promising Clay the Secretary of State job, um, perception is reality. Um, and so they say, look, you can't even, you can't get this guy four more years. He, he wasn't even supposed to be president to begin with. And then, of course, they say the truth that he's an elitist. In this age of the common man, of course, most of America is common man farmers, and this is going to convince most people, look, why should I vote for this Adams character? He, he doesn't even like the common man. Um, and so we will see that um, you know, that's going to cost him a lot of votes. And so what do Adams people, National Republicans, say about Jackson? Well, they say he's basically a thug. They say he's a murderer. They say that when he was a general in the United States Army, he would be he would hang his troops for almost small in, infractions. Um, and so he really is bloodthirsty, and he's a ruffian, he's a murderer. Uh, he hanged people for no reason, and do we really want this murderer in the White House? They say he's uneducated, which is true. He didn't have much education. He grew up, um, for the most part, on the frontier, um, and so he has very little education. And there's all kinds of wonderful stories about Andrew Jackson not being able to, to spell. Um, one quote, he said, Jackson said that he never had much respect for a man who could spell a word only one way. Um, so we see that, you know, certainly we have a contrast, the very educated Adams versus the very little educated uh, Jackson. Next, they say he can't be trusted to be president because he's hot-tempered. Um, he, he did fight several duels in his life. When anybody questioned his honor, the first thing he would do is he said, let's fight a duel. Um, he also was known for his barroom brawls when he lived on the frontier. And so people, the National Republicans said, is this really a man we want in the White House? Can he be trusted to keep his temper under control? And then, of course, most damning of all, they said he was an adulterer, which is technically true. Um, Andrew Jackson, he is going to marry um, this woman um, on the frontier. Uh, I believe her name is Rachel Jackson. Oh, geez, don't quote me on that. It doesn't matter. But um, he married this woman. Um, now, she was a divorcee. She had been married before, and she had divorced her husband. But 
legality is slow on the frontier. The court courtrooms are slow. And so she thought that she was divorced and the paperwork had gone through um, when she married Andrew Jackson. And the paperwork hadn't quite gone through. And so technically she did marry Jackson before her divorce to her previous husband was finalized. Um, of course, she, was, she didn't know this was the case. Um, and so when this came out in the campaign, um, uh, Rachel Jackson was just uh, mortified. Um, and she couldn't believe people were saying this about her. And um, many people think that this caused her to have a nervous breakdown and she will die before Jackson takes the White House. And this is Jack something Jackson can never get over and he can never forgive the National Republicans and Adams for this. He blames them for the death of his wife. So it's a pretty nasty election. Um, of course, we could do a synthesis talking about um, other elections after that. And so let's look at the returns. And so if we look at this electoral map, we can find out that it's a pretty big landslide victory for Jackson. I mean, um, in the last election, he had more votes. And in this election, it's just even, it's even more. He gets 68% of the electoral votes, um, about 56% of the popular vote. Um, and look, if you notice, of course, he's strong in the South and the West with farmers who, like Jackson, he was a farmer. He was a plantation owner. Um, he uh, was on the frontier. He fought Native Americans, everything that Westerners and Southerners like. Um, but we see that Jackson also starts to take some votes away from um, the National Republicans in the North. Um, there's a lot of common men in the North, poor people, immigrants, um, and so Jackson's message really appeals to them. Um, and so we see that this is validation, that this is the age of Jacksonian democracy. The champion of the common man, Andrew Jackson, um, is going to um, win this election easily. We had talked about increased voter suffrage, and as more and more common men vote, they're going to have more of a say in the government. And like I said, he's going to get support from all three sections of the country, um, uniting America to some extent. But also, this is important because he's the first president from the West. He's from Tennessee. And so we see that political, par political power in America is maybe shifting a little bit. It's not going to be dominated as much by the East Coast. Now we're starting to see Westerners starting to get elected president and have more power. And so we're like, yay, common man. This is amazing that the common man from the West, a ruffian, is able to be in the White House. Um, and now we'll show those elite who, who, who is in charge. So we could do a synthesis with the election of 1800. Again, this is a victory of the common man over the elitists. Um, that would be certainly a synthesis you could talk about.